All right, today I'm going to talk about uh, coherent imaging methods. We're going to talk about dark field or Schlieren imaging and phase contrast imaging, which are ways to see things that are transparent. But before we get started, I want to warn you about the lasers we'll be working with. Green lasers are more dangerous than you might think. Um, the green laser pointers you can buy online oftentimes are much more dangerous than they say. Uh, legally, you cannot sell lasers as a laser pointer if it puts out more than five milliwatts. But it, it turns out these green lasers are they're incredible pieces of technology, but it turns out that they run better at higher output powers. And so most of the cheap ones you buy will actually put out quite a bit more than five milliwatts. Furthermore, because of the way these green lasers work, they also output infrared light in addition to the green light. Um, so the lasers we use in our lab when we bought them we measured them and we found out that these lasers that were supposed to be 5 milliwatt lasers actually put out about 50 milliwatts of green and another 50 milliwatts of infrared light. Now the cheap red laser glasses you can get online to, you know, to work with green lasers that don't come from a certified laser company, uh, it turns out they block the green light pretty well, but they don't block the infrared. And so now you put on these glasses and you can't see your beam very well, but you've still got 50 milliwatts of infrared uh, whipping around. So um, in our lab, the lasers you'll be using, they are quite bright. They're 50 milliwatts of, of green. You have red laser glasses to protect you from the green. And on each of the lasers, we've mounted a filter that blocks the infrared. So as long as you keep your red safety glasses on, uh, you should be safe. All right, you'll recall in last, in previous periods, we did some microfabrication. We took a glass slide, we put on some photoresist, we exposed it and developed it, we deposited lanthanum fluoride, and then we did liftoff to create a little lanthanum fluoride pattern on our glass slide. And the goal of the coherent imaging lab is to make images to be able to inspect our lanthanum fluoride patterns. So here's the optical setup. Here's just a cartoon of what you'll be building. Um, over on the left here, we've got our laser, all right? And light comes out of the laser, and the first thing it hits is a pair of lenses, and those lenses are there to telescope up the size of the beam. There's, their only purpose is to make the beam bigger so that we can illuminate a larger area of our lanthanum fluoride. All right, so uh, to make a telescope, you just put two lenses, the sum of their focal lengths apart. So if I have a collimated laser beam coming in, it hits the first lens and comes to a focus one focal length away. And then if I put this other lens such that its focal point is right there, light coming from that focus will then be collimated. All right? And the magnification you get on the diameter of your beam is just minus F2 over F1. So you probably want to use the largest lens in your kit and the smallest lens in your kit uh, to make this telescope. And then you'll put them roughly the sum of their focal lengths apart, but your laser may not be perfectly collimated and you may not exactly know where in the lens, the, you know, the ideal plane for the lens is. So then you'll adjust them back and forth to get your beam coming out such that it's not changing size quickly. All right, and then you'll put your lanthanum fluoride slide in and the distance from that last lens to your lanthanum fluoride slide is not very important, right? Now we just have this beam of light that we're going to use to illuminate our lanthanum fluoride uh, slide. And then we'll put in a, th a third lens and this will be our imaging lens. This is the lens that's going to project an image of our slide over on our screen, all right? And as you'll recall from Physics 123, we call the distance from our uh, object to the lens P, the distance from our lens to our screen Q, to where the image forms, and then we use this equation to calculate Q, so we know where the image will form. And once we know P and Q, we can calculate the magnification of our image. So make sure that you do calculations, don't just start putting things together. You want to know what you're doing and get things set up the way uh, that will work properly. Now, you probably want a fairly large magnification because the lanthanum fluoride patterns we're looking at are kind of small. If you make your magnification too big, then your image gets dim, right? You're spreading the light over a bigger area. But these green lasers are pretty darn bright. And so in fact, if you don't make your magnification pretty big, it might be hard to look at the uh, image that forms. Okay, so now if instead of depositing lanthanum fluoride, if we deposited, say, aluminum, then that aluminum pattern would block the light, and when we did our image, we'd see a shadow of our uh, pattern. 
But we didn't deposit aluminum. We deposited lanthanum fluoride, which is transparent. And so when you set everything up and look on your screen, you'll see something that looks like this. Um, yeah, so how do we actually then see the lanthanum fluoride? How do you see transparent things? Well, we see transparent things with our eyes all the time, right? It's like you have a drinking glass made out of glass, and it's not invisible. It's not like you don't see it until you bump into it. So how is it that you see transparent things? Well, transparent things refract the light, all right? And so we, sh we can tell where it is by the way the light refracts. Um, sometimes we can tell it by how the background, what the things behind the object refract as we look through them. In this experiment, there will be no background. We will be just illuminating the lanthanum fluoride slide with our laser. Everything else will be dark. And if you have an ideal, perfect imaging system, if our light comes through and hits a point on our glass object that causes it to refract, it doesn't matter which angle it refracts because the whole point of this lens is to take light that comes from one point and focus it to a point on our imaging plane. So even though our lanthanum fluoride will refract the light, we won't see it on the image plane because it doesn't matter what path it takes, the lens will make sure that it gets to the corresponding point on the image plane. Well, there's two kind of easy ways to see something that's transparent, and one is called vignetting. If our object refracts light at big enough angles, some of that light will not be caught by the lens, at least scattered out of our imaging system. So that spot then will get a little darker. So by looking at the shadows in our uh, image, we can tell about, you know, we can find the places where light was refracted out of the imaging system. Another way is defocusing. If I move my imaging plane out of focus and move it forward, then all of these different rays taking different paths don't meet on my imaging plane. All right, so if I'm out of focus, I can also see the pattern. In fact, when you go to put your setup together, a way to make sure you get the focus really, really good is move your screen back and forth a little bit until you cannot see any image of your lanthanum fluoride slides. But why would I want to make my lanthanum fluoride patterns disappear? Why do I not want to use these two methods? Well, there's some negatives to them. First of all, like with vignetting, it's not calibrated. How much light got scattered out of my imaging system? It's really hard to make a quantitative measurement with vignetting. Also, um, with defocusing, first of all, you're out of focus. Your image is going to be blurry. Uh, when we use lasers to illuminate, you'll see the evidence of that blurring as uh, diffraction fringes that will distort the image. Also, both of these meso methods work best if you have a big refraction angle. They're not terribly good if you want to look at something like a small amoeba that just refracts light a tiny bit, sh uh, shifts the phase of the light a tiny bit, or thin lanthanum fluoride patterns on a slide, which, you know, don't refract the light a whole lot. So let's come up with a better method. And the better, to understand the better methods we're going to use, we need to think about light in the complex plane. If I have a point in my image and I look at the oscillating light, I can represent that light with a vector in the complex plane. The length of that vector tells me the amplitude of the oscillating electric field. And the angle of that vector tells me the phase of that field relative to uh, the light at some other point, all right, some reference point. So imagine our light comes through. It doesn't encounter any lanthanum fluoride. It doesn't get phase shifted. And so we get this representation of our light at some point on the image. Well, if it instead went through a point where there's lanthanum fluoride, the phase of the light will get shifted, all right? And we represent that as a rotation in the complex plane. So uh, if we had gone and imaged something absorptive, we could like draw a little vector to represent the light at every point in our image. And the places where there's no lanthanum fluoride, we have horizontal lines, or sorry, in this case, we have something absorptive like aluminum. When there's no lum aluminum, we have a, a horizontal line where we have aluminum the line gets blocked, right? The light's blocked. There is a zero length vector and we see our image. But if we put in lanthanum fluoride instead of an aluminum pattern, we get something more like this, where where our X-wing is, uh, where our object in lanthanum fluoride pattern is, the light gets phase shifted, but the amplitude doesn't get changed. And unfortunately, our eyes and CCD cameras don't see the phase, they only see the amplitude. So when we go and look at our image of our lanthanum fluoride, it looks like this, it looks boring. How can we turn that phase into intensity? 
so that we can actually see the image. Well, one way is dark field imaging, also known as Schlieren imaging. And the basic idea is this. I have this light coming through. If it goes through something that shifts the phase, like our lanthanum fluoride patterns, uh, the phase gets rotated in the complex plane. But what we can do is we can think of this rotated vector as a sum of our original vector plus a small change. All right, so this is our resulting vector. It's the sum of these two. In dark field or Schlieren imaging, the idea is to block the un shifted light and just be left with this. We block the unscattered light and only keep the scattered light. Well, how do we do that? Well, notice if I send my nice collimated laser beam in, one focal length behind the imaging lens, the uh, collimated light comes to a focus. The, Im the, the illuminating light comes to a focus. I will call this the unscattered light. But in addition to that, light scattered by the lanthanum fluoride at any point, it's going to spread out and this lens is then going to refocus it back to a point. Wherever it came from, this lens will take the light coming from a point and focus it to a particular point in the image plane. And notice the scattered light does not come to a focus one focal length away from the lens. So if I put a wire here and block the unscattered light, only the scattered light gets through and I make my image. So that's how dark field or Schlieren imaging works. We block the unscattered light and only let the scattered light through, right? So we have this vector, which is the sum of the original unscattered light plus a small change. We get rid of the unscattered light and we're just left with light. And how much light we get depends on then how much phase shift there was of the light in that part of the image. Here's some examples of dark field images that I took using set, setup similar to what you'll be building. Here's an X-Wing, the Empire sig symbol, Ravenclaw. Um, so you see, it works pretty well. But now let's think of a better way, an even better way to make something transparent become visible. And uh, this method is called phase contrast imaging. And the idea with phase contrast imaging is I still think of my light that's gone through, you know, my, my lanthanum fluoride or my amoeba or whatever it is that shifts the phase as a sum of the original unscattered light and then a small change. And in phase contrast imaging, instead of blocking the unscattered light, we're going to phase shift it by 90 degrees. So now we take this light plus this little change and we add them together and we get this vector here, all right? So the point is now this scattered light adds in the same direction in phase space in the, in the complex plane as my unscattered light because we've shifted the unscattered light. So now the amount of light at any point will change as the amount of uh, phase shift changes. And uh, so here, how are we going to actually do the phase shifting of the unscattered light? Well, you may have noticed the mask we used to make our lanthanum fluoride structures, there were some options to make just lines of lanthanum fluoride. And so if you made one of those slides with lines on it, you can use that. If you didn't, we have some made in previous semesters that you can use. And the basic idea is instead of putting a wire here, we're going to align one of those lines of lanthanum fluoride so it's right in the focus. So that the unscattered light that goes through that line gets a phase shift and the scattered light that goes around the line does not get a phase shift. Here's some examples of phase contrast images I took using setups uh, like the ones you'll put together in, in Physics 245. All right? Now, um, what made these techniques work? Well, it turns out the thing that made them work is spatial coherence. Remember, we're illuminating with a laser. It does not have to be a laser. It does not have to have temporal coherence. It could be white light, but it needs to have spatial coherence. All right, why does it need to have spatial coherence? In other words, it needs to come from like a point source essentially, uh, because this whole setup works because this nice collimated beam comes to a focus where we can block the unscattered light without blocking very much of the scattered light. All right, so we need this beam which will come to a sharp focus. It turns out um, if we use like a light bulb over here, what we get over here instead of a small point is we get basically the image of a light bulb. And we could put something in to block or phase shift the light that goes through that light bulb shaped space. But because that's a, a bigger object, not only do we block or phase shift the unscattered light, but we actually block or uh, 
phase shift a lot of the unscattered light as well, and this won't work as well. Incidentally, wh when you buy like a phase contrast microscope, usually those have not laser light sources. They use uh, uh, temporally incoherent light, but it's filtered. Only a small ring of light is allowed to come through. And so over here, uh, the, you get this image of this ring and you can block or phase shift just that ring of light. And it's a very thin ring, so you don't end up blocking a lot of the scattered light when you block the unscattered light. All right, now let's take a look at these two images. Here's one of the dark field images I took, and here's one of the phase contrast images I took. There are two things you might notice. First of all, the dark field only gives me an outline. It turns out on a phase contrast microscope where you use the ring illumination instead of a laser beam, which is like light coming from a point, you don't get the outline. You get things filled in. I'm going to let you think about why that would be, and I'll give you some hints at the end of this, but I'm not going to give you the answer. But the other thing you might notice is this is just a sharper image than that one. Why did the phase contrast imaging give me a better image? Well, here's part of the story, all right? When we do dark field imaging, right, we take our light coming in at some point, but it gets phase shifted because of the lanthanum fluoride. If that phase shift, right, we can, we can write this complex exponential form as a so cosine plus a sine. In the limit of very small phase shifts, the cosine is about equal to one and the sine is about equal to phi, all right? And then we say, okay, I'm going to take this and take the magnitude squared of this. Oh, sorry. Then we take, so E naught times 1 is our original light, which we block, and we're left with just E naught times I phi. But remember, intensity goes as the magnitude of the amplitude squared. So the intensity then, since the amplitude goes as the phase shift, it goes as the phase shift squared. But when we do phase contrast imaging, all right, we don't block the unshifted light, this one right here, we just phase shift it by 90 degrees. So now instead of going away, it becomes an I. And when we take the magnitude of this squared, we get something that is a constant offset plus two times phi plus phi squared. Now remember, if phi is really small, phi squared is really, really small. So with dark field imaging, the intensity goes as phi squared, which is really, really small. With phase contrast imaging, the intensity change with phase shift goes as goes linearly with phase shift, which is only small. All right, so here's a plot of phase contrast versus dark field imaging intensity as a function of the phase shift that the, uh, you know, the lanthanum fluoride or the amoeba or whatever it is you're trying to image imparts on the light. And you can see the dark field imaging, the kind of the intensity as a function of phase shift is parabolic with a, very, with a zero slope at zero and then a slowly growing slope. Whereas the phase contrast starts at an offset, but then it has uh, a nice linear slope. So for small phase shifts, you get much more signal from a phase contrast. Now the phase contrast does have this offset that it sits on top of, right? If there's no phase shift, you still get light. Whereas with dark field, you just get nothing. All right, and that can be a problem. But one nice thing about this offset is that you can tell which way the phase shifted. If the image gets brighter, that means that the index of refraction was greater than one of the thing you went through. And if it gets darker, it means it was less than one. Whereas with dark field or Schlin imaging, you always get positive light in, uh, regardless of the sign of the phase shift. Okay, now just one last thing to know about, just, just as an idea. Uh, if you get done with doing your imaging, you might want to try and model the imaging that you do. And you can do that with Fourier optics. It turns out, um, the light at the focal point where you're blocking it is just the Fourier transform of the light coming through your lanthanum fluoride slide. So um, if I have light coming through my lanthanum fluoride slide, all right, I could just say, well, let's say I have some Gaussian laser beam and then I'm going to block part of the middle of it, right? Like pretending I did aluminum and I'm, I'm going to make a shadow or whatever. Or instead of blocking it, I can just put a phase shift in, in that shape. Like I've got this nice beam coming in, the phase is the same everywhere, except where my lanthanum fluoride is, I'm going to shift the phase of the light, all right? And then to find out what the light does one focal length away from my imaging lens, I just take the Fourier transform of that, all right? And then if I do the inverse transform, then I'll get what I get at the image plane. But before I take the inverse transform, I can do things like I could take 
this line in the middle and, and block it, set it to zero. Or I can phase shift it to simulate phase contrast imaging. And then when I do my inverse transform, I will get the a simulation of the image that I would form. So uh, hopefully, if you have time, you can play around with Fourier optics. And uh, in the process, hopefully, you will figure out why the dark field images resulted in just the outline of my uh, of my lanthanum fluoride rather than light everywhere my lanthanum fluoride was.